thank you so much for being part of us yet again and we head into our discussion of the day make sure you join this conversation on youtube by subscribing to our channel at smart 24 tv and also making sure you comment regarding what we are to discuss so what is coming and well we are going to turn our eyes to the civil aviation authority and uh, the guest who is actually joining us is coming live from Entebbe uh, via a Zoom interface. An interview where we're going to look at uh, many things, but one of which is uh, the mandatory testing that is no more at the airport. Bigger questions, why is it so? And also we're going to be looking at the extension pro uh, project at the Entebbe International Airport. How far has it been ongoing or how far has it reached which uh, in terms of percent do they pass say percentage yes and mm -hmm. also clearing uh, the air regarding uh, the Entebbe expansion because uh, some Ugandans are claiming it now that the Chinese mm -hmm. have taken on the airport and but we have the definition the right of a uh, certain uh, terminology Hishu. that some of you have Hishu. used uh, some of you have actually been coming up with your own allegations that the airport was so we are going to get that clarity uh, from uh, the head of communication <laughs> at the Civil Aviation Authority, uh, Mr. Viane Mpungu Luja. And uh, definitely let's try as much as we can to build on this conversation. Uh, Mr. Viane Luja, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you very well. But we, 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 we. Yes, I'm just trying to enable my camera, but I can hear you very well. Uh, the better if we can definitely get your sound and your view here as uh, we take you through this particular one with my colleague Rita Cavagnoro. Well, we are trying to look at the situation that is happening at the airport, but first, let's try to understand how effective was the mandatory testing at the airport uh, it was uh, extremely effective because uh, a number of positive cases were detected especially in the beginning when it had just started and that shows that uh, the fact that there were some passengers that tested positive it shows that they could have infected uh, other members of the public but the fact that they were detected alone shows that uh, it was effective to a large extent. In terms of uh, an example, by around December, just before Christmas, out of about 60,956 passengers that were tested at Entebbe from October, uh, 292 had tested positive. So that alone shows that it was a very effective exercise. All right, and uh, now let's look at uh, the, the situation of uh, removing the mandatory testing as government uh, because i do understand it was like you said it was very effective uh, but then why did government choose to remove the mandatory testing at the airport uh, it is not only uganda which has actually removed uh, this mandatory testing on arrival several other countries in europe have done the same and this is because the number of positive cases across the globe has been reducing steadily. And also there is a reduction in the global threat of the new variants of uh, concern. And that was well articulated in the letter from the Director General of Health Services, Dr. Henry Mwebesa, who communicated this officially to the public and to the stakeholders at Entebbe International Airport. So those are some of the two major reasons that were cited by the Minister of Health as the reason as to why it was removed. The fact that uh, reduction in global threat was in place, it meant that uh, we could afford to do without the mandatory testing as long as there were other measures still in place. For instance, every passenger coming into Uganda is still expected to have a negative COVID-19 PCR test undertaken within 72 hours from time of sample collection to time of boarding aircraft to Uganda. Besides that arrival requirement, again, there is port health screening on arrival where temperature is checked, among others. But also for departing passengers, we maintained the requirement that they need to undertake a PCR test within 72 hours from time of sample collection to boarding aircraft departing into the international airport. So while one control measure has been removed, 
there are still other mitigation measures that ensure that passengers coming in and those going out are safe. To at least have a video of you as we can actually get to, uh, to show our viewers that we are talking to the rightful person. <laughs> Let's uh, try to also understand what does this mean uh, because Ugandans are very quick to conclusions. Uh, what does this mean that why did the government, as the government removed the mandatory testing, what does it mean? Does it mean COVID is no longer that serious or a threat at the airport or? No, not at all. Uh, COVID, of course, is still a threat. It only means that uh, the fact that uh, you know, cases that were being detected on arrival, the fact that they reduced substantially, it meant that um, there was no more need to continue testing, especially when the people coming in already have a negative COVID-19 PCR test. And as I hinted on earlier on, this is not done in isolation. The aviation industry works in the global sphere. And we have also looked at other countries that have put in place similar measures. In Europe now, many countries that previously had tests on arrival, including UK among others, have also removed those tests. So there is a relaxation of some of the controls in the air transport industry. So the situation now is different from the way it was in October last year at the peak of the third wave. Maybe to jump in, Sonko, here, you said there is a, re a, reduc a reduction after mm. uh, some cases have reduced. Does that mean or cross over even to how you are maybe handling emergency cases at the airport? Maybe if you could enlighten us more, is it also in functional or it is now on reluctant, as you say? How are you handling emergency cases or there is no more emergency cases? Uh, emergency cases uh, of uh, different uh, nature, they not only con include COVID-19, it could be an emergency in any other health-related area. And because of that, we have a clinic at Entebbe International Airport called Kazuri Medical. It is manned by competent health personnel who are port health uh, staff, headed by a doctor who is experienced in aviation medicine. And that takes care of such emergencies. They also have ambulances should an emergency arise so that they prepare adequately for it. But they don't work in isolation. They work in collaboration with several other stakeholders and nearby hospitals in case the emergency is bigger than what they can handle. There are other hospitals that are on call with whom they work in collaboration. waiting on to at least you turning on your video i do not know what is really happening but we're still waiting on you turning on your video at least we can see you sonko please moving forward uh, further and uh, now let's talk about the airport project how far is the airport extension project if you were to give us a a, a, key, a clue on what is going on uh, first of all, apologies, I don't know what has happened to my settings today. <laughs> Even when I touch the start video, it's just uh, not activated. Very sincere apologies for that to you and all the viewers. Uh, but in terms of the airport expansion works, there are several projects. And the big one is the project for upgrade and expansion of Intel International Airport, undertaken by China Communication Construction Company. And that is at 76% level of completion overall. It involves various project subcomponents. One of them is the putting up of a new cargo center with capacity to handle 100,000 metric tons of cargo. That is nearing completion. And actually this year, we are in the process of moving stakeholders from the current area where cargo operations have been held to the new facility. And once the re relocation of stakeholders to the new facility is complete, we shall be able to raise down the current cargo area and in its place, put a completely new cargo, a new terminal building connecting to the current terminal. And that will be undertaken by the same contractor, CCC. But as we do that, we know that the new cargo center is going to be very helpful 
We registered 64,000 metric tons of cargo in 2019 before the advent of COVID. And in 2020, that number slightly reduced to 59,000 metric tons of cargo, but it went on to increase to 67,000 metric tons of cargo in 2021, which is a sign that cargo traffic in and out of Entebbe International Airport is growing steadily every year, with exports, fortunately, being the bigger number, the bigger produce that we actually handle through Entebbe International Airport. And that is good for the country. The major exports that we handle as a country include agro produce, especially vegetables, flowers, fish, and the like. So with a new facility in place with bigger capacity of 100,000 metric tons of cargo, it is good news for farmers and the producers of uh, fresh produce in the country. Besides the cargo center, we also have runways. Work has been undertaken on both runways. There are two runways at Entebbe International Airport. The main runway is runway 1735. Work was undertaken and completed on that. It was resurfaced. The same was done to runway 1230, completed. We have also had work on aircraft parking aprons, which has increased the capacity of aircraft that we can park at Entebbe International Airport, as well as work on the taxiways where aircraft passes after landing before it connects to the, where it parks. All that has been undertaken by the CCC, the Chinese contractor, as part of the US dollar 200 million project for upgrade and expansion of the International Airport. But besides that one, there is also another project that is internally funded by Uganda Civil Vision Authority for the expansion of the current passenger terminal building. If you arrive at the airport, is that new blue building that you see, and that is part of the terminal extension, which has been undertaken by Siani Brothers Uganda Limited. The departure area of that project is already in use by passengers. And we expect that soon we shall embark on works in the arrivals area for that particular project as well. Then and, uh, you were to, uh, speaking about goods, cargo earlier on. Maybe if you could uh, highlight for us uh, expectations as the public towards um, handling ourselves on our goods and services as we uh, may be in the premises of the, uh, the airport premises or even on board. They had a scenario last year when the grasshoppers during uh, uh, grasshopper time was trending around there and uh, the situation quite faced a lot of criticism but maybe if you could educate us and inform the public what exactly we have to know on how to handle ourselves with cargo or what we are meant to travel with or without because I have also um, a concern someone was going out of the country my sister and happened to we happened to pack gear for her and she was like no i'm going to be held accountable here i'm not supposed to pack this or cross with it to uh, on board maybe share with us an information let the public know what to expect around those scenarios uh, there is cargo that is transported uh, by cargo carriers while there is also baggage that you carry as passenger baggage when you are traveling. Uh, there is that that you carry as hand luggage, and there is parts that you actually check in, in with your bag. So when a passenger is traveling, it is important to check the destination where you are going, the requirements for the destination. For instance, in relation to grasshoppers, there are some destinations which do not permit uh, importation of grasshoppers into their country, while there are countries that are liberal about this. So when you are traveling and you intend to carry some of these items, either grasshoppers or matoke, or any other food-related items for that matter, uh, it's important that you check with your airline. It can advise whether the country permits that or not. And in case it does permit, it is also important to again check with the airline on what is permissible in hand luggage and what you should actually check in. Normally you are advised on that at the point of checking in your baggage. So in relation to what happened the other time to do with grasshoppers, uh, it, it is not something, first of all, the fact that the passenger had grasshoppers was not a problem per se. The only problem arose with the conduct on board aircraft, the going ahead to sell it on aircraft. But that has since been addressed. 
to ensure that it does not re recur. Uh, the other items that may be restricted include liquids above 100 milliliters. For instance, uh, if you're carrying a perfume or that is above 100 milliliters, you, may, you are not allowed to carry that as hand luggage. Instead, you would have to check that in, into your bag that you check in as you enter at Entebbe International Airport or most of the other airports for that matter. Uh, Mr. Viani, now let's try to talk about this particular issue. I do believe it has, uh, you've actually come across a number of uh, questions regarding the same matter of uh, the Huwain, Hawain, is it? Huwain. Huwain, <laughs> H-U-E-N. So we want to understand what does that mean and what, that, what does it stand for? Because most of the Ugandans were quick to throw blows at the government, mm. blows to the civil aviation authorities saying that maybe, the just Chinese, maybe the Chinese uh, took over the has airport. Already taken what does over. that mean? Mm. Uh, that is an international court for Entebbe International Airport, allocated by the International Civil Aviation Organization, ICAO, which is the global body that oversees air transport operations across the globe. Actually, Ugandans are mispronouncing that abbreviation. It is not pronounced as UN. It is an aviation terminology. And in the aviation industry, we read it out as Hotel Uniform Echo November. We use that aviation lingo to pronounce it. But every letter has meaning. Every letter stands for something. The first letter, H, stands for the region. And if you notice that all the East African countries, their ICAO codes start with the H. H represents the East African region. It actually represents the African and Indian Ocean, all the states in the African and Indian Ocean. But all those states are allocated three letters at the beginning. H is for East Africa, F and G, uh, starts with the other countries in the region. Then the second letter, U, is the one that represents the country, Uganda. And the last two letters, E and N, represent the airport location, which is Entebbe. A similar example that you can look at is the code for Jomo Kenyatta International Airport in Nairobi. It is HJ, it is HK, JK, with the first letter H representing the East African region, the second K standing for Kenya, and the last two JK representing Jomo Kenyatta. Similarly, in Tanzania, the code for Julius Nyerere Airport is HTDA, with H representing East Africa, T standing for Tanzania, and DA representing Dar es Salaam. The other airports in Uganda, besides Entebbe, have a similar code. Uh, a hotel like Guru, for instance, the code will be Hotel Uniform, Golf Uniform, H-U-G-U, -U, with the last two letters representing Guru. So this is a very normal practice in the aviation industry, and these codes have existed since time immemorial. Since Uganda became a member state of ICAO in 1967, we have had this code for the airport. It is only that a few Ugandans only discovered this code, either yesterday <laughs> or, 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 or recently, so they are talking about it as if it is a new thing and relating it to the talk about Chinese and that kind of thing. But this is an international ICAO code that should not cause any reason for alarm among East Ugandans. Shouldn't cause any reasons for uh, alarm regarding the Chinese talk, I get it from you, Chinese talk or anything. Mm -hmm. What should we know? About the Chinese loan, we, uh, Uganda has a loan with the uh, Exim Bank of China for upgrade and expansion of the Entebbe International Airport to the tune of US dollar 200 million. And that loan was secured in 2015 for the project that commenced in 2016. Under that loan, we have a grace period of seven years before starting to pay, to pay, uh, to pay back the loan which we shall pay back in a period of 20 years. So we are still under the grace period, which ends in uh, 2022, December later this year. So we are still well within the grace period. So the talk of Uganda failing to meet the loan obligations is completely unfounded because you cannot fail to meet your obligations when you have not even started paying back the loan. 
So that is not true. It is completely false and uncalled for. And the country has stated explicitly in no uncertain terms from all levels that we do not have any intention of failing to meet our obligations as part of the loan agreement. So there shouldn't be any cause or reason for alarm. And I also need to state that the loan terms are actually very good, contrary to what people have been stating on social media and other platforms, because we are looking at an interest rate of 2%, repayable in 20 years, of which we even have a seven-year grace period. Which other financial is going to give you such loan terms? So it's a very good uh, project financing agreement that should not cause any alarm. Also talk about uh, the money that was used for mandatory testing. Uh, mm -hmm. We would love to know where was this money heading to um, ever since the exercise started because people used to pay a certain amount. Which amount were they supposed to pay and where was this money going to? The mandatory, during the time of mandatory testing, the cost for the test was 30 US dollar per passenger. It was collected by Post Bank Uganda on behalf of government. Uh, of course, the testing was not done by Uganda Civil Vision Authority. We are not health experts. It was done by experts in health matters, delegated by the Minister of Health. So the Minister of Health would uh, definitely be in a better position. Uh, to explain that particular bit. Uh, but we as facilitators of air transport, we hosted all the different stakeholders, the stakeholders from Ministry of Health, uh, the laboratories that were put in place to conduct this, the government laboratory, as well as other stakeholders, including Post Bank, which was doing the collection, uh, NITA Uganda that was supporting us with the internet connection, among others. And maybe uh, lastly, if you could share with us, in case of any uncertainty in regards to any across the entire globe, we had COVID-19 as an example. What, what if there comes any uncertainty? Can the airport do handle emergency, emergency livelihood, emergency activities? To what capacity? We have actually handled quite a number of emergencies before the advent of COVID-19 there was the threat of Ebola and Uganda through Entebbe International Airport and the stakeholders from the Ministry of Health and others managed this pandemic very well. You remember very well that it was a threat in the neighboring countries. So chances were that it could have easily been imported into Uganda, but we put in place a system and that platform we built on that even when we were handling COVID-19 uh, the platform that had been put in place to manage uh, or to combat the fight against Ebola was helpful in the fight against COVID-19. So the capacity is there as a country. We are actually being looked at as a case study. Many countries used to come to Uganda to benchmark on how Uganda managed to combat the threat against Ebola while it was hovering in the neighborhood and it never entered Uganda through the International Airport. And one of the things that we're using that are still in place, that was first installed uh, uh, in 2007 when we were handling Ebola, were these uh, the, the temperature, the automated temperature screeners that we were using at the airport. For instance, there is one which is in one location, but it is able to detect temperature of anyone who is within the vicinity of 30 meters within its radius. And the operator of that machine is only sitting on a computer and looking at anyone that may have a higher temperature. So there was a time actually at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, when some people entered through the International Airport and thought that their temperature was not being checked. This is only because we already had that technology in place that someone didn't have to bring a manual temperature gun on you, but someone seated on a computer was able to see those within a radius of 30 meters. And in case anyone has a higher temperature, the machine beeps and the operator is then able to zero down. So that among others is one of the infrastructure that we have in place.
to ensure that we are able to handle such emergencies. Uh, let's also sum up this discussion with uh, knowing which other projects that the Civil Aviation Authority have uh, this particular year. What are the other projects that you're looking at? And uh, if I told you, can also give us a statement on what is happening across uh, the airport in Hoima as well. If you have any information regarding that, please help us understand more and the projects that you do have as the Civil Aviation Authority this year. Uh, starting off with uh, the project at uh, Hoima in Kavare, uh, it is not directly under Civil Aviation Authority. It is being undertaken by the Ministry of Works and Transport, which is the parent ministry that uh, oversees aviation operations in Uganda. But of course, in collaboration with us, we have a team on the ground as well that provides advice. That project is moving on smoothly, and we expect that uh, it will be completed in a couple of years from now. And when it does, we shall have a multi-purpose airport that has capacity to handle passengers as well as cargo uh, with a multi-purpose terminal building that is expected to contribute a lot in the area of uh, oil and gas. It will become a second international airport as alternative to Entebbe International Airport. We also have 13 upcountry airfields spread across the country and we have a national aviation master plan that was promulgated in 2014 covering a period of 20 years up to 2033. As part of that master plan some of the airfields were lined up for upgrade to international status and these include Guru, Kasese and Arua. Uh, detailed master plans for these airfields are already in place as well as detailed engineering designs for these three airfields, which only await availability of funding before specific works for upgrade of those airfields actually commence. Recently, we had uh, a new domestic air operator commencing flights from Kajansi and Entebbe to tourism sites, and that is Ba Aviation. They commenced uh, scheduled flights to tourism promotional airfields like Chisoro, Pakuba, Kasese, and others, which is good for promotion of tourism. They also put in place uh, an arrangement with Uganda Airlines, whereby once the airline brings passengers to Entebbe, they are able to transport those passengers direct from Entebbe to those airfields. Besides that, we have quite a number of air operators that have recently joined Uganda's airspace. At the end of last year, in October, we had um, Shadja, we had uh, Air Arabia commencing flights to Shadja in UAE. You remember that most of the operators that we have had from Uganda to UAE have been flying to Dubai, like Emirates Fly Dubai and Uganda Airlines. Now we got an, an air operator, Air Arabia, flying to another city in Dubai, which is Sharjah, in October. We also had Airlink commencing flights to South Africa in September last year, and that was helping us to replace uh, South African Airlines, which exited the Uganda airspace earlier on. Uganda Airlines itself also commenced flights to South Africa, as well as to Dubai. And since that, they have quite a number of passengers on that route. And very recently, we had Saudi Airlines commencing flights to Saudi Arabia, where we have a lot of Ugandans going for employment and others coming back. The plan is to also encourage Saudis to actually come and invest in Uganda and also visit us for tourism promotion purposes. We continue to court several other airlines to join the Ugandan airspace. And the more that join us, it is a vote of confidence in Uganda's air transport system. We now have a total of 17 international air operators operating in and out of the Entebbe International Airport. Lugia, Thank many you. thanks for joining us with this particular discussion. It has been of very good importance and I do hope all the viewers can ably uh, be safe with the fact that all the rumors... <laughs> he has they, cleared at least the exactly, air the about hula the that is happening at the airport. <laughs> uh, the airport issues. Thank you very much and surely... We shall get back to you on matters regarding civil aviation. Thank you very much. And we take a break. S&B continues shortly.